Hey everybody, thanks for joining us here today. This is Nicole with Topaz and I'm very excited to welcome back Blake Rudis. Hi Blake. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Blake is going to be presenting his four-step HDR workflow and I'm very excited. He incorporates a lot of Topaz into his post-processing so I'm excited to see how he's using it. So let me tell you a little bit more about Blake really quickly and then I'll hand it over to him. Since 2010, Blake has been publishing written and video tutorials on EverydayHDR.com and was awarded the best HDR blog of 2012 by the readers of HDR One magazine. In addition to a successful HDR blog, Blake self-published Exploring HDR, the DSLR Survival Guide, and 11 Things Every Photographer Should Know About HDR Photography. Blake has recently also teamed up with David Dubay to, cre to create Learn Photo Now. It's a city-to-city -city traveling photography training and it's designed to do one very important thing and that's inspire you to become a better photographer. So definitely keep a lookout for those courses that might be coming to a city near you in 2014 and we'll give you information about where you can check out that schedule at the, uh, in the follow-up emails after the session. So with that, let me go ahead and turn it over to Blake and let him go. All right, I just want to first start this off by saying thank you to Nicole for uh, putting this together. This uh, venue that Topaz gives us is awesome, that we can all learn from each other, um, pros that are working out in the environment, and also the, the YouTube tutorials that you put on uh, the Topaz site. Um, those are awesome. I learned a lot from those. So thank you very much. Okay, so what I'm going to be showing you today is the four-step creative HDR process. It's the process that I go through pretty much every time I post-process an HDR photograph. And it's, it's very particular. It starts with good brackets. It's step one. Step two is going to be mild tone mapping, and I use photomatics. And step three is your post-processing, and your creative post-processing is step four. Today, I'm going to be doing this entire tutorial with only Photo Effects Lab and, and um, Topaz products. So uh, I really want to show off the power of Photo Effects Lab because it's awesome. So with step one, I'm just, for a lot of people who know HDR, uh, this is going to be a refresher for you, and that's, that's a good thing. Uh, anytime you can get a refresher on this is good. But for those of you who may not know the backgrounds on how to get an HDR photograph, I really want to stress some things and, and get this stuff going through your mind so that you know how this stuff uh, starts from the very beginning. A lot of times you see the end product of an HDR photograph, but you don't know all the stuff that went into it to get to that point. So your brackets... Auto exposure bracketing is used in your camera to get uh, the, your photos should be free of camera shake. So I highly suggest being tripod mounted or, and even more so with a shutter release. That's going to be your best bet for getting free, uh, your, your exposures free of camera shake. But you can hand hold. There's some techniques that you can use for that as well. Um, your brackets should cover enough exposure values. We're not talking about apertures. We're thinking shutter speed here. So um, you want to be in aperture priority mode so that when you do your bracketing, it only captures different shutter speeds. And always remember with HDR photography, the composition is critical. A lot of times we get in over our heads with just how great we can make a photo look with the HDR process that we completely forget about composition. And first and foremost, the beginning, from the very beginning of a photograph to the end of it, composition is critical. Um, so I've put together a checklist in 11 things every photographer should know about HDR photography. Um, that really helps me when I'm doing my HDR process on the front side. And that's, I want to be in the raw file format, aperture priority mode, with my aperture setting usually around between 7 and uh, 7.1 and like 16. That way I get a full range of D. And you can do all the selective focus stuff later. Um, and then your ISO, always set it as low as you possibly can for the environment because the more ISO, the higher the ISO, the more image noise is invited. And when you start doing HDR, it's an image noise party. They like to come together and just have a lot of fun in your photograph, and it doesn't make for a good-looking photo. So keep that as low as possible. Again, I'm not going to stress this stuff too much because I'm going to be giving out this presentation later so that you can refer back to it, and you can download this checklist in a more pretty form and actually print it out and put it right in your camera bag. So you want to make sure you're auto-exposure bracketed, tripod-mounted, shutter release equipped, and in continuous fire mode, and go. You can start capturing HDR photographs. So how many brackets are necessary? I get this question all the time. But that really just depends on your camera's ability. Um, 3, 5, 7, 11, do you really need 11 exposures for uh, HDR photography? Not necessarily. And in most cases, I've found that you really only need three exposures. That's your plus two, your zero, and your negative two. 
Um, I've done a lot of studies on that, and that seems to be the best range. So if your camera can only get three exposure values, that's all you need. So here's an example. Here's a negative two. This is your dark side. Here's your, uh, your zero exposure value and your plus two exposure value. That's what you should be looking for when you get your HDR brackets. Right here, again, I'm not going to harp on this too much. What I've added here for you is what you should be thinking about with your HDR process uh, to get you to the point of a, a final HDR photograph with the single question in mind, is the subject scene or focal point moving? Um, and then you can go through this later uh, to, to get to that end point. So now we're going to get into tone mapping, which is step two. Um, I use Photomatix Pro for all my tone mapping. I love it. It's very fast. It's easy to use. Uh, but the things you're looking for when you tone map, and these are the, the, most, the four most important things if you take anything away from this on the, on the tone mapping side is not too dark, not too light, not too stylized, and avoid oversaturation at all costs. Now, the reason why you're not trying to do a whole lot of this stuff, the stylization in your tone mapping software, regardless, because you're going to be doing that in the post-processing. So this is an example of a really bad HDR. And don't worry, I'm at fault for this too. I can't tell you how many of these I took when I first started the HDR process because I thought this was cool. Well, then I learned that the HDR community looks at this as circus puke. And I couldn't figure out why until I, I asked myself a simple question that one of my professors in, in college used to tell me all the time is if a, a photo doesn't look right to you, turn it into black and white and see what's wrong with it. So if you turn this into a grayscale image, we have a 50% gray image, and this is what we want to avoid. So when we go into the post-processing, we want to recover a lot of the stuff that tone mapping destroyed, uh, and this one uh, is too far gone. Um, after doing this kind of tone mapping stuff, you pretty much want to start over from square one. So try to stay away from this stuff, this toxic yellows and electric blues. They don't really turn out very well. Now this is an example of a good HDR. So if we look at the black and white of it, we can see that we have a clear white point and we have a clear dark point that our eye can rest on, can stop on, and it can move back and forth from within the image. This is what gets your eye looking. This is what gets the, the viewer intrigued. So now we're going to go into post-processing with step three. I'm going to cover all this stuff really practically for you in a second here. I really just want to harp on this stuff first, and then we'll get into it. So number one goal, recover shadows and highlights. Avoid excessive clippings of your highlights and your shadows, but at the same time, make it look like what you envisioned. Now, a lot of people will look at HDR photographs and say, well, the scene didn't look like that. Maybe it didn't, but maybe that's how it looked to you. And that's okay because that's where this comes into the creative side. You become more of a of an artist with HDR photography than you become a photographer. So um, the programs that I use for my post-processing, especially for today, are going to be Photo Effects Lab, Denoise, Clarity, and Detail. Um, and your quick workflow, things that you want to think about while you're doing this very quickly are going to be recovering your highlight and shadow, reducing noise, adjusting your color temperature, your tone curve adjustments, dodging and burning, and sharpening. And for the creative side, you want to take the image to the creative realm. You want to think about evoking, evoking moods in the viewer. You want them to look at this, and, and you want the color within the photograph to get them to feel a certain thing. Um, use all kinds of different colors, happy, sad, uh, you know, mundane. All of that can be accomplished through uh, color. And you can also add elements of other photographs if you're using something like Photoshop, like which I, I use that most often, but I want to show you Photo Effects Lab today. Some helpful programs, of one I'm going to be using today are Topaz Adjust and Topaz Restyle. And I, all the, the photograph that I'm using today, I'm going to allow you to download the brackets and use them as well. Uh, and then you also are going to have a forum where you can post your, public, your uh, representation of what I'm showing you today. So I'm going to get into that practical app application right now and start off by going into Photo Effects Lab, or sorry, uh, Photomatix. My apologies. So these are the five images I'm going to be using. A lot of people say, well, do you do anything to your raw files before you tone map? And I don't. I just grab all my, all five, in my case, five uh, photographs and drag them and drop them right into Photomatix and start the, the tone mapping process. So when I press OK, for this photograph, uh, for all of you as well that are going to be playing with this image as well, I, I photograph this on a tripod. So you want to select by correcting horizontal and vertical shifts in your pre-processing. And there were no ghosts in this because it wasn't moving, so you can just select automatically. I don't reduce the noise in Photomatix because that's something I'm going to do later. I do select the reduced chromatic aberrations, though. So if I pressed OK, this would all start, but I'm going to do this like a cooking show and show that I've already done all this stuff. So 
Um, imagine we're going to commercial break, and here we go. I'm going to start right into tone mapping. Any minute now. Here we go. All right. So now we're going to do our tone mapping. And like I said before, I don't want this to be too light, too dark, or too stylized. Let me get my palette straightened up here. All right, here we go. So these are all the default settings in, in Photomatix. Now, I do want to increase the strength on this um, because that's the whole reason why I'm, I'm doing my HDR stuff is so that the, what I'm doing here is going to translate into my final photograph. Color saturation. I usually don't go any higher than about 60 because any more than that is too much saturation, and I know that it didn't look like that. So for the... Um, Luminosity, I'm going to bring that up and see what happens as I bring up the luminosity and bring down the luminosity. And then I usually stop at a point that I think looks right after going back and forth until I get about what I'm looking for. And then I'll start manipulating from there. So right now it doesn't look the best. I'm going to go into the detail contrast and heighten that up and see what happens as I increase the detail contrast in conjunction with the luminosity because they do kind of work hand in hand. So with the lighting adjustments, I'm going to make this uh, move this down a little bit, move it up, see what happens when I when I adjust the lighting adjustments on this, and I'm going to put this at about negative 1.6. That looks about right to me. So your smooth highlights, this is going to help um, all of the areas in the photograph where the highlights are going to be affected. Um, if they're if it's down real low, um, let me see what's happening with the preview here. So it looks like the areas that are being affected in the photograph from the smooth highlights are pretty much right in here. So it's not affecting a whole lot in this photograph, but you'll notice in, in other photographs where you have a, a very wide open sky that's bright blue or a bright color, that that smooth highlights is really going to come in handy for you and help clean up those clouds. So for the white point, um, let's see what happens with the white point as we move this up and down. I like to, I hope I don't make anyone sick, I like to move my sliders back and forth real far until I find a point that I think looks about right, and then I just stick with that. So that looks pretty good to me. And then with the black point, I'm going to do the same thing. Some people don't do anything with the white and black point, but now I don't want to go too light, too dark, or too stylized. I just want to get something that's just right. Uh, before I go into the actual tone mapping part, or the actual post-processing part, I should say. So then gamma, we'll just leave that alone. If we were to increase that, it would increase our, our um, overall brightness in the photograph. And the temperature, I'm going to increase the temperature a little bit. Now, I could increase the temperature in other things as well, which I'm going to do that in Photo Effects Labs also, but just to, to get it to where I think it looks good into the tone mapping process, I'm going to go with something about, about 3.7 to 3.8. And the micro smoothing, I'm going to go ahead and see what that does for my photo. And a lot of times micro smoothing can be too much and it just gives it that too grungy of an HDR look. So this is about where I would end it in my tone mapping. This is the end of step two. At this point, I would process this. And if we can see our before and after, here's our before. I don't have much to work with here as far as an HDR photograph, but now I've got something that brings out my details without being oversaturated or being too dark or too light so that when I save this as a 16-bit TIFF, it's going to have a ton of dynamic range in it that I can manipulate later in the post-processing. So whenever I save this stuff, if I'm going from a raw format, I always go from raw to a 16-bit TIFF, and then you have a lot of dynamic range to work with in the uh, post-processing side of the house. Because if you saved it as a JPEG, uh, a lot of people don't know the difference between RAW or TIFF and JPEG and RAW, but if you save it as a JPEG, you're saving a, an instance, a snapshot of what that photograph would look like, and you're destroying everything else. You're throwing everything else away because you're trying to make the most compressed image you can. So a JPEG might be about six megabytes, whereas a TIFF image would be something like sometimes 60 to 100 megabytes. So it does take up a lot more space, but the reason why it takes up more space is because it has more for you to work with. All right, so like I said, this is a cooking show. We're already done with this. I'm going to go ahead and if I were to press process, I could save this as a 16 bit TIFF, but I've already done that so that I can get right into Photo Effects Lab without anyone having to wait on my uh, tone mapped file. So let me open Photo Effects Lab here.
Now, you could do this in Camera Raw. You could do this in Lightroom. A lot of the stuff that I'm doing here is, is universal to a lot of other uh, post-processing software. So you, you don't have to use Photomatics, uh, Photo Effects Lab for this. However, it is a very powerful po program. And if you already own a lot of Topaz products, this is, your, this is your central hub. You can do all of it right from here. So here's the tone mapped image that I was working on in Photomatics. And now let's get into the fun stuff that uh, Topaz Labs has to offer for us. So the first thing I want to look at here is the color temperature. It seems a little bit too blue for me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the temperature of this to make it just a little bit uh, more like a sunset. You know, if it was down here, we're looking at, uh, uh, it doesn't, it looks almost like blue hour rather than sunset. So this is a sunset photo. So I'm going to hike up that temperature a little bit. I'm not going to mess with the tint or the saturation too much on this. I'm just going to get right down into the exposure. So what I'm trying to do here, like I said before, is I'm trying to recover highlights and recover shadows. So what I want to do is move the exposure until I find a mood that works for me in this photograph. And for me, that's going to be actually a little bit on the darker. I'm also going to increase that contrast a little bit, that contrast between light and dark, and see what, what I get from that. Um, I kind of like what I'm getting on the plus side of the house. However, the clouds are a little dark to me, but I'm going to go ahead and fix that later. I'll show you how to do that in a second. As far as dynamics and sharpness, I don't really want to adjust the dynamics here because what I'm going to be doing is going into Topaz Adjust and Topaz Clarity and Detail, and I'm going to be adjusting the dynamics on a grander scale rather than um, doing it with one slider adjustment here in Photo Effects Lab. Same thing with sharpness. I'm going to go ahead and fix that later. So with the highlights, I'm going to want to bring those highlights up to recover those highlights. If you see right here, um, let me zoom in. This white area here should be a highlight blowout. But what's happening during the HDR process, the tone compression, is turning that to like a gray value. So what I want to do is I want to recover that. You know, a lot of people say shy away from highlight blowouts. Well, sometimes highlights blow out in reality. If you were to look at a sunset, the sunset that I took, the sun was blowing out in that area. So don't fear blowing out the highlights just for the sake that someone said, watch out for highlight blowouts. So I'm going to bring that up to about the, the 40s, high 40s. I'm going to put this back. And then with the shadows, I want to recover some of those shadows that were lost during the tone mapping process. So I'm going to bring that down uh, quite a bit and so I can recover some of the shadows that are going on in these trees. So with the whites, I'm going to bring up the whites again, and the reason why is if I look at that tone compressed area, the highlights only covered so much before I need to add more to the whites. Um, so if we move that down to zero and then move it up, we start to see that that highlight blowout starts to turn into what would have actually been a highlight blowout in reality. So I'll put that up to about, the, about 20, that should work. And then with the blacks again, that's going to help me recover some of those shadows, but I don't want to do it so much that it destroys everything. Um, but maybe, uh, um, let me zoom out real quick. Move this. It looks like, or actually around the higher range is actually pretty good. So one of the other powerful things here in Photo Effects Lab is the fact that you can work with layers. And it's actually very intuitive, just as intuitive as Photoshop uh, with the layers and the masking that you can do. So as I'm looking at this photograph, I, I see up in the, in the cloud that I, I kind of want those to be a different color. Um, I want them to look like the sunset that I saw. There was a little bit of uh, pinkish haze in there. So what I'm going to do is you can duplicate this layer. Um, anytime I go into adding multiple layers or doing adjustments, uh, I always want to duplicate the layer to make sure that I don't ruin what I already have. So this is still in step three. We've moved on to step three. This is post-processing. We're still in step three because I'm going to be doing some more advanced post-processing here. So I'm going to duplicate this. You can either press the Duplicate button or you can press Control-J, which is also the Photoshop uh, command, or uh, if you're in using a Mac, that's Command-J. Um, that's also the Photoshop command to duplicate. So what I want to do is I want to recover a lot of the color in the sky and give that um, more of a sunset type color. But I don't want to do that to the foreground. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do like a split um, 
temperature adjustment here. It's kind of like a trump lore effect on your eyeball. Um, if trump lore is like the, the play of play of eyes. So when you see two different um, color temperatures over a photograph, it actually intrigues you a little bit more psychologically because it, it doesn't quite look right, but it looks right. If that makes any sense to you. So I'm going to increase that tint a little bit and really get some pink going on in that sky. And then I'm actually going to increase the saturation a little bit too. And not a whole lot, just enough to give me something to work with there. So there's my before and after. I don't like what it's doing to my foreground though. So what I can do is I can actually um, create a mask on this. So here's the mask, it's already there. And when you click on mask, by default, it goes to the masking section. So if my brush value is at zero, it's working with black. If it's at 255, it's working with white. So if you paint with black, it's going to remove that area. If you paint with white, it's going to add it back in. So what I want to do is I want to get rid of what's going on down here in the greens of the, um, of the farm here. So I'm just painting with black. And I can increase my brush size. If you click on the brush size and then you press the right bracket key or left bracket key, that will actually increase and decrease the size of your brush as you work. Again, that's another Photoshop um, hot key that is also used here in Photo Effects Lab, which I think is awesome because a lot of the stuff that I use in Photoshop, I can do right here in Photo Effects Lab. So I like that a lot better. Um, I've got something nice in the clouds, but then again, at the same time, I've got uh, a nice color temperature for the ground as well. And I want to really get in on this barn and get all of that pink off of the barn so that the barn doesn't look pink. Okay. Mask. I'm just painting with black. Now, if I wanted to, I could move that brush back up to 255 and paint back in with white to get some of that color back into different areas of the photograph. So that's just a helpful thing to remember. And again, if you're whatever value you're working with, in this instance, it's brush value. I can increase and decrease the size of my brush based on, or I guess the value of the brush, uh, whether that's zero or 255. So if you paint with gray, it'll do like a mild kind of look to the to this so it doesn't completely take it away with black or completely add it with white it just gives you like a transparency that you can work with so I like what's going on here with step two um, or step three here with our post processing we've got our temperature right everything's looking pretty good and here's where I'm gonna get technical and get into the noise aspect of this so what I'm gonna do here is because I have the ability to and I can manage my layers I can actually type here um, sky temperature, or sky temp for, for the sake of speed here. And if I press this button here that says plus from stack, that will create of what I've done here. So I'm just going to go ahead and press that, show you what it does. So with this new stamp, this stamp has created its own layer of everything that's going on underneath it. So if I were to take the visible eyeball off of the stuff underneath, it doesn't, doesn't show me any difference. If I were to take the visible eyeball off of uh, the stamp, it shows me what's underneath. And then as I reduce those, you can start to see what's happening. So if I reduce all of these visible eyes, right now what you're seeing is a stamp of everything that's going on below it. And I always do that too. I make stamps as I'm going through so that if I, de if I use some denoise adjustments or, or if I use a topaz adjustment that uh, is just a little overpowering, I can adjust the opacity on that. So I'm going to call this noise layer or noise because it's already a layer. So I'll just call it noise. So now I'm going to go into Topaz Denoise 5. And what I want to do in Topaz Denoise is really just kind of take a little of the edge off of the noise in the photo. Uh, what I like about Topaz Denoise is that it's a very powerful noise adjustment software, more powerful than a lot of the other stuff that I've used. Um, and, and most recently, it's very comparable to Camera Raw and Lightroom. They've done a lot of adjustments to their noise features. But what I like most about the noise reduction here in Denoise is that I can get rid of a lot of chromatic aberration that's happening here, too. So because this was a raw file and there's not a whole lot of noise in it, I'm going to go ahead and put raw light. That's just going to give me a nice light tone. If, you, if I zoom in here, um, you can see um, that noise that was happening right in the clouds. Let me look at my original. There's some noise right here. I'm not sure if you can see that. Hopefully you can. And then if I go to what's happening with the photograph after doing the noise adjustment, you can see that that noise is gone. However, I still have what's called a chromatic aberration here. And chromatic aberrations typically happen within the lens. Um, 
and they're like a, they're, it's it's it happens with the diffraction of the lens, typically at wider angles. So I'm at 24 millimeters on the 24 to 105 Canon lens, so I've got a lot of lens diffraction here on that wider angle. But that's not a problem for topaz denoise. I can actually get rid of that. And if you see here, there's a little red critter of noise right there. There's also some red critter noise down here. That stuff didn't exist in the photograph. That was black. So I want to get that back to black. And the way I can do that is after pressing that raw light um, preset, I can come over here and clean up my color. So it's going to help clean up the color noise. And if I need to go any deeper into that, I can actually go up into the reds and adjust the red um, color cleanup as well. And if you see right there, that little critter, I'm, I'm going to show you the before and there's the after. I've gotten rid of that. Now up here, I have some blue that's, that's happening still from that chromatic aberration. So I can actually increase the blue as well and get rid of that blue chromatic aberration. There's the before and there's the after. So that's done a lot for my noise. Not only has it fixed my noise, but it's fixed the color noise as well. I've returned this barn back to a gray barn, not a RGB speckled barn. It's a gray barn now, just like it was when I was there on scene. All right, so after denoise, I'm going to go into clarity, and there's a couple things I want to do with clarity. And one of the things I like most about Clarity, actually before I do that, let me duplicate this layer so that we don't get lost here. And I'm going to go ahead and I just press Control or Command J to duplicate that layer and I'm going to type this, I'm going to call this Clarity. That way I, I know my layer control here. One of the, the, the biggest things that I love about Topaz Clarity is the hue saturation adjustments that are built right in here that go beyond just your RGB, CMYK, oranges, they go into cyans, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and, and hit that in here too. So for the clarity, um, I'm seeing in the contrast in my photograph here that um, there's quite a bit of black in the clouds that wasn't really there when I showed up on scene. So I'm going to go ahead and try and clean that up a little bit. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to decrease the contrast here in the micro contrast. If I increase it and decrease it, I can see the difference of what I'm getting from that effect. And that's why I do what like this hyper uh, effect where I go all the way to the right, all the way to the left, just to see where it's going to land and see what I think looks best and then find somewhere in between. And then I'm going to go ahead and reduce the low contrast a little bit. Again, increase it, see what happens, decrease it, see what happens. And that's about right. And then again, moving on to the medium contrast, increase it, decrease it, and then find a nice in-between layer. So what I'm getting is I'm taking away some of the edge off of the black on those clouds to make them look a little bit more like it was when I was there. And you could also go into the black level, the mid-tones, and the white levels as well. But all I really want to do is just take the edge off of the contrast that was happening there. Um, and it does, you can't just do that with one contrast slider. That's the great thing about Topaz Clarity is it gives you four different contrast adjustments that you can go into. It's more of a local adjustment than a global adjustment because you're adjusting those very small areas on a, uh, on a grand scheme level rather than having one adjustment that says contrast and hiking it up and hiking it down. It doesn't really help you as far as um, the very particulars that you can get into with Topaz Clarity. So I'm going to open up the hue, saturation, and luminosity section as well. And what I want to do is I want to get my greens back to what are green. Now, the green that's existing right here in this photograph look more like avatar green to me, not like green that I would see in Missouri. So I'm going to get those back to a real green rather than a green from some futuristic movie. And the way I'm going to do that is start by adjusting the hue of that color. So when you adjust the hue of a color, you can really change that color into the, almost any color on that spectrum that's within that adjustment slider. So, I mean, I can almost make this look like fall by bringing that green all the way down. But what I want to do is just take the edge off of that green, make it not so toxic, and just make it look like the green I would see on the scene. Like I said before, you post-process these photographs like you envisioned, or you post-process them like you saw them. Either way, it's up to you. You're the artist here. You have complete control over that. So also in that hue, I'm going to look at my oranges and see what's going on with that orange in the background there. Um, if I increase the orange, 
I can see what kind of colors I can get from that orange and decrease the orange. To me, I want to take the edge off of it a little bit because it was a little too on the orange side for me, even for a sunset. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the luminosity and change just how dark and how light those colors are. So if I increase and decrease the luminosity in the oranges, I can see a lot of tone compression. It's basically happening right there because that's what you're doing. You're compressing the tones just within the orange level. So if I compress those tones just a little bit um, down farther, or let me go up a little bit, increase them a little bit to really turn that into a blowout, into an orange blowout area because that is part of the sunset. I, I welcome blowouts um, in, in my post-processing here. So let me look at the yellows too. And it looks like yellow is very much a part of that blowout that's right there where I think should be a blowout. So I'm going to leave that there too. And then I'm going to go into saturation. So what I'm doing is uh, I'm going to look at the saturation in the colors uh, that, I, that I think are most effective here. So in this case, it is that orange. I took the edge off of the orange by changing the color of it just a little bit, but now I'm going to increase the saturation of it just to make it punch out a little bit more at you. And I don't want to go too high because just like in tone mapping, you want to avoid your saturation, oversaturation, because oversaturation can get pretty ugly pretty quick. Just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it and doesn't mean that it looks great either. Now, that's my personal preference, and that's uh, words of advice coming from Blake, but... Now you take it with a grain of salt if you'd like. All right, so I'm looking pretty good in clarity. Now the next thing I'm going to do is recover some detail here. And how am I going to do that is right there with Topaz Detail. Pretty ironic, huh? So again, I'm going to duplicate this and turn this into my detail layer. Now, I, I purposely reduced the contrast in the sky because I wanted to get some of the black off of the clouds. But now I want to reintroduce some contrast, some detail into the foreground because that farm has a lot going on in it. I want to bring that back. So I'm going to start that up with Topaz Detail and just do a really simple uh, adjustment. Now, if you were using something like uh, photo, uh, uh, Photoshop, you could do a high pack sharpen or something of that nature. But again, I think that what's going on here with Topaz products is that you have the ability to really get into not just one type of detail. You have your small detail, your medium detail, your large detail. So it's more of a local adjustment, even though it's on a global grand scheme. So I'm going to increase the, the medium detail. And you see what happens when I bring out that medium detail um, in the trees in particular, and also within the um, the farm itself. I'm, I'm bringing, I'm really starting to make those areas punch. I'm making what looked like here to be a more like a 50% gray if you were to slam it all together, now has a differentiation between light and dark, and that helps to boost that and pop that out a little bit. So let me see what happens when I move into my larger details. Again, I think that might be a little too much, so I'll leave that where it is, and then let me hit my small details a little bit. And you could use a preset for this. You can use whatever you want, but really all I'm trying to do here is just kind of sharpen it up a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and allow that one to go through because I like the detail there. Now, again, I'm going to go ahead and mask out the sky. I'm going to get a big brush, and I'm going to mask out the sky with black because I want that to stay without as much detail. Now, if I want to get really clever here, I can go with Edge Aware and then reduce my brush size so that now the brush knows what the edges are of that tree line so I can keep that tree line because the brush knows that it should be keeping that area. So I've, if you can see on that little snippet there, I've protected that area. And then now I'm just going to go in with another brush and go back, reduce my edge wear so that I can clean up those areas right above that. And that's pretty good. Um, again, just kind of cleaning it up a little bit. And this, I would say, is a done image. At this point, I'm at step three. I'm at the end of step three. And with the four-step creative process, the fourth step is taking it to a different level, taking it to a colored realm, taking it to a more abstract area. So I'm going to do that with Topaz Detail or Topaz Adjust next. So at this point, I could be done. Uh, I could post this. I could publish this. I think this is a great-looking photograph. But I'm going to take it to the next level by going into Adjust. And this is where we transition into step four of the creative process. So we'll just call this step four. And... What I want to do actually is, I'm going to delete that, sorry, I don't want to duplicate it. I want to create a new one from the stack, 
And just so I can clean things up here, I'm going to delete everything underneath. Oops. So that uh, if you ever make an error like that, you can press Control Z, and that will bring back your area that's also called undo. Um, this is going to be step four. And I'm going to create two layers for this because the first one is going to be adjust, and then after I show you adjust, I'm going to get into restyle. So let me get into adjust five here. With Topaz Adjust, I already gave it away. There it is. Let me reset all of that. All right. So with Topaz Adjust, um, you get the ability to bring this into, uh, you know, with the with the adaptive exposure, you can really push this to another uh, realm by increasing the uh, the depth in the photograph with these regions adjustments. Um, so if we can look at the before and after there, what I did was I just increased the adaptive exposure and then moved up the regions a little bit. And if, for, if you don't know how this works, you basically divide your image into uh, whatever the regions would be, uh, the little squares. So this would be uh, the higher the regions go, the smaller the grid pattern gets, so the more local the adjustment gets. That's why it looks like it's crunching it up just a little bit more. So I can also increase the contrast in this, and for the creative side, I want to make this a really contrasty photo because I'm going to add some tonality to this also. And then I think I'm pretty good there on the adaptive exposure. I'm not going to mess with the color or the noise. I'm just going to go into detail, and I'm going to hike up the detail in this a little bit too. Uh, and again, you don't just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. Don't go that high, all right? So just kind of keep your Keep your uh, desires at bay when you're doing this kind of stuff. I just want to increase the strength and detail just a little bit. Now, uh, just recently, um, Nicole did an awesome tutorial on um, how to tone a photograph in Topaz Adjust. And I really I just want to touch on that real quick just to give a nice cross-process look. If you're interested in how, um, how you can do this, I would suggest looking at the Topaz tutorial that Nicole did because it's, it's awesome. Um, so I'm going to give this a tonal effect, a cross-process looking effect. I'm not going to mess with the blacks. I want to keep the blacks and the whites alone, but all the colors in between, I want to change those. So I'm going to do the first one like a um, like a cream color. Let's see. Um, that should work. And then the second color, I want to be um, like a yellowish color. And that should work. So I'm also going to increase the tonal strength on this and see where that takes me. Okay, so it looks pretty good to me. It's a little too much, so I can just go to the transparency and then increase that transparency a little bit so it's not affecting it too much. So now I've created a feeling in this photograph. It's more of a nostalgic feeling with that cross-processed look. You could save this as a preset and you're done. You can do this to every photograph here on after. Um, so here's the before, here's the after, just giving it that creative effect. Um, so if I press OK, there is the adjust one. Now I'm going to go back to this layer down here, uh, and this is just for the sake of showing you a different way that you can creatively style your photographs, and I'm going to go to Topaz Restyle. All right. Again, gave it all away because one of my last settings is up. So um, what I love about Restyle is that just what I did in Topaz Adjust is basically what's happening right here in Restyle, just on a more uh, micro scale because you have five different areas here that are being affected by the color rather than just the uh, four in Topaz Adjust. And the presets are awesome because all I have to do is go over here and see which ones I want. Like I really like this Monarch Red Stain. However, I don't like it how powerful this is. So what you can do is right up here in the opacity, just go ahead and drop that opacity a little bit. So now I've created a very warm feeling, a very warm sunset feeling right here real quick with one selection from that uh, Monarch Red Stain. And I like that. I could call this a good, done, creatively post-processed photograph because I've taken it outside the realm of what it was and brought it into a more colored realm. Now I can also go into some of my other favorites here and go into um, like this ice emerald color. Again, a little too much. If it's too much, just drop the opacity, and you, and you can see how it goes from there. But what I really like is I like things that are cyanotyped and sepia-toned and um, you know, basically monotone-looking photographs. I really like what's going on here. To me, this is a more nostalgic feeling than what we had before in the Topaz Adjust. So let me go ahead and process this and show you one more thing. So now, 
if you want to get like a creative border on this or a vignette, because I didn't do any vignetting in Adjust, I can do a more selective vignette right here in Photo Effects Lab, and this is really cool. I can just duplicate this layer, change this to Multiply, and it looks horrible right now. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. All right. Uh, I'm going to increase the brush size, and I'm back, and I'm going to paint on this mask. So now what I can do is I can start to make my own vignette around these edges and really start to pull that viewer into the photograph based off of the mood and the tone that's already being set by Topaz Restyle. And now if I really wanted to recover some more area too, I could change this back to white and I could recover some dark area right here into these bushes and really start to punch those out a little bit. But again, I think that's too much. So I could change that down to more of a grayish color rather than either all black or all white. And now I've got my recovered darks. I've got a nice vignette um, that is different from the ordinary vignette. And it gives you the ability to play too. If you see on a vignette and a vignette goes over a highlight, it starts to compress it and look really ugly. So my suggestion is to go ahead and just black out those areas in those uh, in those uh, highlighted areas. So you're, you're basically protecting those highlighted areas from that vignette so that it doesn't look like a vignette. It just looks like the edges are pulling the, the viewer in. So that's pretty much my four-step creative HDR process where I start right from the brackets all the way into photomatics, um, into uh, post-processing, and then to um, the fun stuff where I can colorize it. And I could go even farther. I could add images from another photograph, but that would be something I'd probably do in Photoshop. All right. Well, thank you so much. This has been awesome. <laughs> great. Lots of information, um, a lot of great feedback already, and we have a ton of questions. If you have any questions for Blake, you can type them into your questions module now, and we'll try to get to it. Um, we'll be asking him questions for about 15 minutes, and then at the end of the hour, announcing uh, who won the complete collection in Blake's new ebook, and also announcing some discount codes. So let's see what we have coming in. I'm going to start from the top here. Okay, Tom had asked, what reasonably priced camera would you suggest for HDR photography, or is there a certain type of camera that you suggest for HDR photography? You know, that's a great question because when I first started HDR, I was using an Olympus E30, and I don't even think they make it anymore, but it's a five-year-old camera. And just until uh, February of this year, um, that's what I was shooting with until I bought my Canon 6D. Now, uh, so what I would suggest is any camera that can do auto bracketing exposure. Um, that's really all you need, and anywhere from, I mean, I don't know specific names because I was an Olympus guy. At first I was trying to stay out of the whole battle between Nikon and Canon, but then I jumped into it. Um, so I really don't have a preference. If you can do auto exposure bracketing, it doesn't really have a limitation when it comes to HDR photography, not your camera or your equipment. Great. Okay. Uh, let's see here. And Dom had asked, um, autofocus or manual focus, or does it make a difference um, whenever you are uh, shooting your brackets? If you have uh, autofocus, that's just fine. Just make sure that the autofocus that you have is on your focal point, first of all, um, which is usually what I do. Um, and then if you have your, your camera set to continuous fire mode, so you're shooting like a paparazzi guy going check, 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 um, it will automatically remember what you had focused on from the first photo, so it doesn't necessarily matter whether you're auto or manual in that case. All right, thanks. All right, Richard had asked an interesting question. He says, is there any disadvantage in creating different exposure files from Adobe Camera Raw instead of actually physically bracketing using your camera? Yes. Um, it, it all depends on the image you start with. So if you start with a very even zero exposure value, which if you're shooting like a, like a, a, a brick wall, yeah, you could easily make them in camera raw. But if you're photographing a sunset, like what you're seeing here, and I were to try and recreate those plus and minus exposure values, um, you're telling camera raw to fill in the blanks where something wasn't. So if I expose for the foreground as my zero exposure value but didn't give it the chance to do my negative two for the sky, then I kind of lost that from the sky. However, if your subject is moving or if it's very windy outside, one of my suggestions would be maybe just capture one photo of them and then either recreate them in Camera Raw or Lightroom or 
um, in Photoshop, that's fine as well. All right, let's see here. Another question comes from Evan, but I know several other people asked it as well. Um, how do you deal with the HDR or the halos that typically come when you're in the tone mapping uh, section of your process? Um, it, it's it's very dependent upon the photograph. I've done two tutorials on that on my YouTube channel about how to avoid them. Well, avoiding them altogether is your is your number one thing, mm -hmm. and then how to fix them if you. Have. Um, and those are available on my YouTube channel um, under uh, if you just type in like halos or something in my YouTube channel, I'm sure you'll be able to find it. But for the most part, I won't process an HDR photograph that has halos in it. To me, if, if it's got a halo in it, I've taken it too far. So um, at that point, you have to just start manipulating the adjustments. Look at the luminosity, look at the white point in particular, and the smooth highlights. Typically, incre increasing the smooth highlights will help to alleviate some of those halos, but you also lose some of the detail in those highlighted areas. So a lot of people don't want to make the sacrifice of, okay, well, if I, if I do this, then I lose what's happening in the foreground. But especially with what Photomatics has done recently, they've made it very easy for you to tone map it, save it, go back, retone map it for something else, and save it. So then you can blend the two exposures for the best of both worlds. So you can blend it for the sky and for the foreground, which I've also done a tutorial on that, too, on my YouTube channel. Okay, let's see here. I had a couple other questions I wanted to ask you that were coming in. Let's see here. Where did it go? Oh, Sam had asked if you usually work on an image as fast as you did today, and if not, what time do you usually take? Um, well, no. <laughs> All of, like I said, this is a <laughs> cooking show. Um, so I probably, you know, even on a one-hour webinar, I think I spent about 20 hours putting this together. So, um, you know, that's a lot of time that it took for me to just take, okay, one image, let's see what I'm going to do with it, and go from there. So it's a lot of experimentation. And the best advice I can give to someone who's thinking about it is that, you know, especially with the HDR process, I can take I can take the brackets for an HDR image in less than 30 seconds, but I know that it could take me anywhere from 30 minutes to 30 hours to make that photograph look awesome. And and that's getting up, walking away from the screen, looking at the screen from a distance, going upstairs, getting a cup of coffee, coming back downstairs, taking a look at it, because every time you look at it, it's going to be different. So. What I like to say is if you're thinking about posting your photo for publishing, to whether it's Facebook, 500 pixels, whatever, give yourself a night to think about it and come back and look at it again because I guarantee tomorrow morning you're going to wake up and look at it with a whole different mentality. So I would say on average I spend about 45 minutes to an hour and a half per photo, and that's with some pretty detailed masking. I saw something in there about... Um, um, uh, luminosity masking. And when you get into luminosity masking, which is awesome, it's absolutely gorgeous what you can do with that stuff, that's where it gets upwards to two to three hours sometimes. And that's all That's all estimates, too. Yeah, different for each image. <laughs> Let's see here. I ha Kurt had asked, he says he has some of the Topaz programs. Which Topaz programs do you find the most effective for you? Oh my goodness, <laughs> um, that's a hard question because um, you know I really like adjust. I think first and foremost, if anyone's going to buy any H, any Topaz product, I think adjust is probably the first place to start because I don't know if, if this is how you see it too, but I see a lot of the stuff that's in adjust um, is uh, pretty blanket over a lot of the other things like detail and clarity. Now they have a lot of the same stuff in them, but um, Topaz Adjust is like, I don't know, to me that's like the, the baseline. I bought it in 2008. I don't know if it was Topaz Adjust, just number one or something like that, but um, I've been using it since 2008 and I love Adjust. And then uh, Clarity, Clarity's awesome. That one just came out and I'm, I love Clarity. And one of the things I love most about Clarity is that hue saturation adjustment that I can select right there that's actually more intuitive than Photoshop. I don't know, um, going into Photoshop, if you look at the adjustment that they give you for hue saturation and, and it's only like six, whereas you get that you know that full spectrum with clarity, and I love that. Um, everything I, I focused on here, I would say, are probably my favorite ones: uh, restyle, detail, clarity. Um, I'm really liking Photo Effects Lab too, which is great because you know doing this Learn Photo Now thing, um, teaching beginning photography, it was always hard for me to find a program that somebody could um, 
could start out in as a beginning photographer, but still have the room to move up as they got more advanced. And I think Photo Effects Lab is awesome for that because it's got everything you need as a beginning photographer to post-process your stuff. But then you can go beyond by how much you add to it by all the, the plugins that you and investment, you can make yourself a pretty good investment in your beginning career. So between Photo Effects Lab, Adjust, Clarity, Detail, um, Restyle, and Denoise. Denoise is probably the most powerful. If you were to buy three to start out with, I'd say Photo Effects Lab, uh, Denoise, and, and Adjust. But at that all point, right. you may as well just buy the whole thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know, because I love them all. It's, it's hard for me to say which one I like the most. Blake, thank you so much. This has been great. A uh, ton of information and a lot of positive feedback. I think you uh, definitely inspired some workflow tips here, so thank you. Awesome. I'm glad. I'm glad I could help. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.